I want to give the press. Well, if you guys can. Here with a conductor's cap, but I was going there. So my name is Gwen Samuel, and I'm a parent from Meriden, Connecticut. I am also the founder of the Connecticut Parents Union, which is a membership association to support parents throughout the state of Connecticut so that they can effectively support their children. I have some of our parent volunteers. We have Miss Nidra from Stratford, just moved to Guilford, mother of five. We have our student support, which is LaShonda. I'm getting it. Look, look, look. I have a high school graduate in the back, Daquan Smalls. And we have some great, yes, he should be in school, but we already agreed he will make the time up. So his absentees will be excused and there is no excuse for him not to get caught up. And we're just here today for Tis the Season to be reading. And before we get started in the Tis the Season, I would like to have some welcoming remarks and um, from State Representative of New Haven, Gary Holder Winfield. He's also the chair of the Black and Puerto Rican Caucus and a strong supporter of parents, so I'm glad to see him here. So if you can give us some words, that would be great because we're in your great city. <laughs> Welcome you to New Haven. I'm happy that you've come here. Uh, we all know all of our cities have an issue. Uh, some of us think of the achievement gap and the issues we talk about as only issues of communities like New Haven and Hartford and Bridgeport, but we know that we have issues with everybody. We know that the people at the top aren't doing as well as we want them to do. So these issues that we're talking about and reading in particular are very important. So I'm very happy that this bus is sitting in my city. Uh, I want to thank uh, Gwen and the people who work with Gwen with CT uh, Parents Union for giving a voice to parents in a way that parents have never had a voice before. Uh, that's important. All of us in uh, politics and in education talk about parents. Our parents aren't a part of the conversation in a real way, and you've done that. So again, thank you for coming here this morning. Uh, and please, you know this already, but whenever you need help, just call me. Thank you. So we can actually begin, since it's already 9 o'clock, and trying to stay timely. On your seats, you have a packet of information. Hi! And if you can pull out the papers, they'll be very brief. And in the front of the page, it will give you a little bit about the Connecticut Parents Union. So like State Representative uh, Holder Winfield stated, it's very important that parents take a more visible lead in supporting their child's academic and life well-being. We think of just parents of getting our kids ready for school, getting them to school. We work, try to maintain the roof over our heads, but the reality is we are in some tough economic times. And as a result, we have more families that are experiencing homelessness as a whole family since, uh, I think they said over, since like 20 years or so. So we're really up there in regards to homelessness. And so I invited key leadership to attend the event to give presentations about who they are as an individual, the organization they represent. This bus represents resources. Yes, this is tis the season to be reading, but that's reading in every aspect. So for Head Start and early childhood, we're talking about getting our kids ready for kindergarten. If you read the handout, it says students that are kindergarten and young, if they go into kindergarten with few words, their chances of being behind in their later years are greater. So parents, we have a responsibility to read to our children. Now let us understand there are some parents that don't know how to read, but that doesn't excuse us as a parent to finding that resource to support their child, and it's never too late to go back to school. I got my bachelor's degree at 40 years old, I had a Head Start program who just stayed on me. I think they wanted to strangle me at times, but I went to college, I got my degree, and I'm here today. So it's never too late to learn. And the reason why I bring the young people, because they are the future. We throw that cliche out there, but they are the next lawmakers. And I need someone to be in good positions to protect me when I am a senior. So understand me, I have a self-interest in supporting the youth. Let's be very clear, I love you, but I need you to take care of me when I am a senior. So that's why we are here today. And so we will also be working with parents across the state to help you, to connect you with resources, 
to help you with parent education. Sometimes pride can keep us from reaching out for help. But if I had let pride, I lost my job two years ago. No one would ever know because it still didn't excuse me from being a parent. I still applied for jobs, but I still had to keep the lights on, I still had to keep the roof over the head, and I still had to provide food. It was tough, but I knew my responsibility as a parent. But I wasn't in this alone. I knew that I can talk to other parents, other community leaders. I know if I had a problem with policy, I would call my state rep. So I understood my power as not just a parent, but as a taxpayer and as a registered voter. And if nothing else, I want to make sure everyone is a registered voter as we travel this state, because the bottom line, legislators hear their constituents. But if they recognize you don't vote, then the question would be, well, why do I have to really? I'll kiss Gwen's baby on election time, but I don't really have to listen, maybe, because she doesn't impact me. But when you vote, you impact them and they will listen. So let us be very clear, you have a lot of power as a constituent. We are, be, they are be, we partnership, right? We elect them, they speak on our behalf. And not just the adults, not just rich people, not just middle class people, the baby that's in that carrier right there, he speaks, he or she speaks on their behalf as well. The baby in the womb, they speak on that child as well. So we're bringing this bus, enjoy it. It's not gonna be all, you know, we're gonna be talking, but we have giveaways, enjoy the scenery. We're gonna have some hot cocoa, some muffins and blueberries in the back. And then we probably have to hit Zumba once we eat those muffins, but that's okay. So at this time, I had my agenda. I'm going to be introducing Miss Nita Rutherford. She's a parent from Stratford. She's going to tell you her story, and I, I can tell it, but I'm going to let her tell it. And State Representative Holder Winfield needs you to listen very carefully, because I'm being nice today. And come on up here, Nidra. Thank you very much. All right, I'll sit by the baby. We moved to Connecticut, my family, my husband, and our children, from Charlotte, North Carolina, 2008. Um, we moved to Stratford, lived there for a couple of years, and then we lost our house. And so my husband works for a hotel in Norwalk, so we were able to live in the hotel. Um, shortly thereafter, the board, Stratford Board of Education opened an investigation on my family because I was still taking my children to the Stratford schools. And once we were notified of the investigation, we explained to them what had happened and what we were doing. And we were told that our kids could not attend Stratford Public Schools anymore because we were no longer residents. Um, I talked to one of the registration officials and she said in order for us to meet the res res residency requirements, we would have to stay at a particular hotel in Stratford and every week produce receipts showing that we were there every week. Well, the superintendent, who is also the district liaison for the McKinney-Vento Act, she notified, this, she notified me through a letter that they gave to my son that they were no longer allowed to attend Stratford schools and that we were required to either pay a tuition of 10000 for my elementary or 13000 for my middle school children. And this was on a Friday. And so that weekend, I was able to research some information online and I ran across McKinney-Vento, which was the first time I'd ever heard of that. And McKinney-Vento allows homeless families if you come, become homeless to stay in your school of origin and so on Monday I called the superintendent and had a conversation with her about what I discovered and she said no your family doesn't qualify um, because there are people in Stratford that pay taxes we're taking up their money so our kids had to leave um, so at this point again she's the liaison for McKinney Vento at, in Stratford at this point, I started researching to see whom I needed to speak with, and I ran across the Connecticut Legal Aid, I might be calling the name wrong, but I called them and explained to them what was going on, and they told me that because we had been in the hotel for a couple of months, we didn't have a case because we were there too long, and McKinney Mitchell no longer applied, and also they were not taking any education cases because it was not an emergency. Well, of course, to me it was an emergency because it was my children. And so I, I asked the Board of Education for an appeal on their decision, and we were granted the appeal. In the meanwhile, I researched all that I could find 
about my rights. I'm a kid. I'm and parents, I'm trying to tell you. So, nonetheless, um, we were granted our appeal. I collected all the information that I could collect. I spoke with um, Louis Tallarita in Hartford, who is the homeless education person for Connecticut and Kenny Bento. At the appeal, prior to the appeal, the attorney for the Board of Education uh, sent us a letter saying that we needed to prove, show, take pictures of the hotel room we were staying in. We need to bring W-2 forms, pay stubs, um, and any other information that might be pertinent to our case. Um, also, their argument was, the reason we didn't fall under McKinney-Vento was because my husband worked for the hotel. And because we were getting a discounted rate, and apparently this hotel was a four-star hotel that it was adequate for us and it did not fall under the terms of McKinney Bento, although it was a hotel. So at the hearing, um, evidence was brought up with, with the Stratford <coughs> attorney. He had the picture saying that the, because the wording in McKinney Bento says that an adequate fixed dwelling. And so they were arguing that this was adequate and a fixed dwelling. And so because it was nine of us in a double room with a bathroom and a refrigerator and a microwave, they argued that that was adequate, um, a, an adequate dwelling for us. And it was fixed because it was my husband's job and we could stay there discounted. And needless to say, the Board of Education uh, found favor with us and they allowed my children to stay in their schools. And because of all this, because we left our home, I had to quit my job because I was a flight attendant. And so one of us had to be home to take the children back and forth to school because we didn't know about McKinney Bento. So I, we, um, after this happened, Dr. Cornish called us. She set up the transportation to get my children back and forth to school from Norwalk to Stratford and New Haven. And everything was fine since then. Well cycle around to find a house and I talked to kids now attend school in Norwalk because my kindergartner was not allowed to register in Stratford with the other children because that was not her school of origin. So I took them out and put them in Norwalk schools. And I asked the Norwalk officials about when we move to where we are now in Guilford, when we move to Guilford, will my children be able to attend to stay in Norwalk schools for the duration of the year? And they told me no. Although I do know that McKinney Vento does a lot for the children to stay there and finish out their school year. And so they said that the superintendent, the assistant superintendent said, no, they can't stay there. You're no longer, you know, homeless, so you have to take them out. Again, that was a fight. I was threatened with appeal, and, but I know my rights. Mr. Tallarita had my back, and he spoke to the Norwalk Department of Board of Education. So that's that. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you for sharing your story. Here with the worst achievement gap in the country, next legislative session, we're going to be ta tackling educational issues. The bottom line is, we need kids ready for kindergarten. We need to ensure that our kids are supported through the school system so that they can graduate with the skills they need to be productive citizens. We have businesses leaving the state because we don't have qualified workforce in Connecticut. So you can't have barriers like that that impact children that are homeless. The bikini Vento Act, which is a federal act that's under the educate, the ESEA, uh, which is the Education Elementary Secondary Educational Act, known as No Child Left Behind. It, it gives you language so that children do not experience the effects of homelessness. And clearly, her children experience the effects because the adults didn't interpret the law properly or they chose not to enforce. But whatever the case may be, we need policy makers to look into how we are interpreting it, not only at the state level, but at the federal level. And I, met, I had the pleasure of meeting with the U.S. Department of Education um, Early Childhood uh, Office with Deputy Secretary Jacqueline Jones and Arnie Duncan's office. And I spoke to our congressman, Senator Blumenthal, who was on the Education Committee. And we will have these lessons about who's who when the next legislative occurs. Because parents, we need to be at the Capitol. We need to be a force so that babies like him, he should not have to experience 
the decision making as left unless it's positive um, of adults. So we need to do a better job. Good, Good morning. So um, I'm Gwen Samuel. It's a pleasure. We chose it's your set shelter. And we appreciate that. Yes. We sure do. So if you can tell us a little bit about your shelter and what you do, and then we have a host of things oh. that belong to your uh, constituents there. Oh, well, first Because we're all in it. Let me say thank you. We appreciate it. We're in it together. We, we, and we need and we need people there with us I mean this is a this is a rough fight you would think that with the current economy and how it is that people would understand that with the job law and homeless for pregnant women and women and children we have 20 rooms and we house up to 49 um, we, we have 49 beds so we can take 20 rooms of various compositions our largest room can house a mother with three children and we do, luckily through a grant from the Department of Social Services, we have some smaller cribs that rotate into rooms. So we are able to change our composition a little bit to accommodate some families that may need, um, as opposed to a bed, may need a crib or a toddler bed. So we do make arrangements that way as well. Um, we take people in for up to 60 days. Um, we actually have taken, we have, 11 families at this point that have been here longer than 60 days and the reason why they've been longer than they've been here longer than 60 days is because cuts in funding with regards to section 8 and other transitional housing programs so um, this is truly a fight that we all need to be in because um, just folks cannot move on if their housing situation is not stabilized and the jobless Good morning, Roz. Good morning. morning. <laughs> um, sorry about that. But the joblessness, you know, is really contributing and it impacts all of us because what it does is it destabilizes all of our communities. You know, when you live out in the suburbs or you live in an area where the house next door to you is vacant, that's not a good thing. You want to keep people in those houses and you want people to move into those houses because that's how you protect your investment in your property be you a renter or a property owner. So um, we, again, 49 people, 20 families, we provide three meals a day, breakfast, lunch, and dinner um, for them. We help them with um, interviewing skills and parenting skills, and um, we're working on developing a financial education program, which I saw was on your list of agenda items, and so we want them to know budgeting and things like that. and. Um, we just try to wrap our arms around them as best we can to support them. We also have a child care center program. We have it's an early head start program which houses which care in that program and then we have a school readiness program that takes up to nine children. So we have a total of 17 children in our daycare um, in our in our daycare facility and the 17 children primarily come from families that have been homeless or they're, they're either currently homeless in the shelter or formerly homeless. Once they move out of the shelter, we do not say you have to take your child because you're you know, in a stable condition. We want to ensure that the stability for the, children, for the child continues and so we continue to care for them. So for right now, we have four families that were formerly um, homeless in, in, and in the shelter who their children still attend our, our child care center. And then the rest of them are current residents as well as uh, we have two um, children who are um, actually a referral from DCF as I point to Tony Lagan who's <laughs> from DCF. Um, but they're from DCF and um, it's, it's for exposure, it's exposure in the community and stability in their lives as well due to some transitions that particular family. So, so I want to think of our program as a holistic approach to stabilizing children and providing care for them, although it's technically not categorized in that manner. Well, we thank you so much. And I'm actually going to talk to my boss, which is here. I've been on the play for two years. Like I hired with Gazelle Institute at Yale University. And we're actually doing a loving and learning workshop that talks about the importance of read, talk, play. So maybe we can speak to some of our agencies and see what we can come up with. Uh, everything requires funding, but we're very innovative that maybe we can bring the program to your center.
And so in these days and times, you have to be innovative, create, creative, collaborate, you know, all kind of things because everybody's budgets are stretched to the wire. But we're still obligated. Yes. Right? Can, that cannot be the reason why we don't protect children. True. And obligated means that there's a duty and we do owe the community a duty to provide good service. Absolutely. So thank you thank very you. much. And we'll figure out, I have my young people in the back, we'll get all this stuff into your center. Okay. And um, we're also going to give you one of our proclamations. Oh my gosh, thank so, you. And this is actually from the governor. So I'm giving, so what we did, last year was our first Tis the Season to be reading. So we worked with the Commission on Children, Parent Leadership Training Institute, Elaine Zimmerman's uh, office, which is the executive director of the Commission on Children. And the governor, uh, we presented a proclamation. So this is our second annual. And so what the proclamation says, uh, by the state of Connecticut, by His Excellency, our uh, first, uh, uh, by Governor Danielle, Danielle P. Malloy, Governor. Here, these are the words. Whereas brain research informs us that reading is teachable to 95% of our students, yet up to 40% of African American children, no, excuse me, 40% of American children will have difficulty learning to read and require specialized instruction, and whereas more than one third of children from poor communities enter kindergarten behind their peers in reading, and whereas a child who is not reading by the end of first grade has only a one in eight chance of ever becoming a proficient reader. Our goal is to go from proficient to goal. I just throw that in there. Whereas, as of the 2009 National Assessment of Educational Progress, which is called NEEP, also known as the Nation's Report Guard, found that among fourth graders, 22% of black students and 15% of Hispanic students met or exceeded the proficiency standard, compared to 52% of white fourth graders, while among eighth graders, only 11% of blacks and 19% of Hispanics met the proficiency standard compared to 51% of whites. And whereas experts advise that children need more than 1,000 hours of experience with books even before they begin formal education, and whereas investing in early childhood learning is one of the most proven ways to strengthen our state and our nation's economic position. Two more whereas. Whereas Connecticut values its children, and I'm gonna send this to all of the lawmakers, I'm gonna repeat that, you're good. None of you are great, we love you, but I'm just saying. <laughs> whereas uh, Connecticut values its children and believes parents, any parents on the bus? Woo! Grand guardians, children? Yes. There we go, we're getting there. Uh, whereas, where is that? Where, and believes parents or guardians and other family members are their first teachers. Therefore, I, Danelle P. Malloy, Governor of the State of Connecticut, do hereby officially proclaim Thursday, December 16th. Isn't that Friday? That's how you know he copied. Okay. <laughs> uh, pro proclaims, today's the, uh, uh, proclaims December 16th as tis the season to be reading day. So since we won't be here on Friday, we're giving you this proclamation. Oh, you. And from all the, the community of Connecticut, we'll get that into you. It was a pleasure, and we will definitely will be staying in touch and tell your parents we'll come back and see them. Okay. Thank Beth, you. they're putting wraparound services in the schools, which is great because schools are communities within communities. And so it's meeting the uh, the needs. So I actually want us to learn more about Boost and then see how we can maybe look at a best practice to implement in other cities. And then we're going to hear from Ms. Rosalind Williams, the Director of Education and Training. And I love the title, Trauma Matters. Okay, you're giving me sign language. About the program from the Connecticut Women's Consortium. Thank you, Ms. Roz. I'm going to walk out the door for you. Women's Consortium. And you know, it's a new role for me since March. But trauma does matter with our children. 
if we kind of think about just this one shelter that we're in front of today, how many families are displaced in their lives with children. Then we send these children to school, the children go to school. Think of what emotional impact that has on the child to have no real stability, no home of their own. You know, so this is huge. You know, I'm, I'm so impacted by children and, and our ability that sometimes, and a lot of people say, well, you know, you've experienced adversity in your life. Children come to school, they act out their behavior, they're labeled and said, we have a, a disciplinarian problem. Your, children, your child is misbehaving. We call the parents in. They suspend the child from school because of the behavior. He's not paying attention. He or she is not paying attention in class. What causes a child not to focus when they're in school? It's so easy for us today to label a child says, you know, he has attention deficit or she has an attention deficit. And the worst part of all is because of those quote unquote labels that we give our children, we medicate them. They have to go on some kind of prescription drugs, but we never ask the question. We never ask the question, not what's wrong with that child, but what happened to that child? to cause them to have these behavior problems, to cause them to act out in school. They act out in school. It's a safe environment there at school. So, of course, this emotional trauma may come up. We have to recognize that today as parents. And before we can, it's part of, you know, the school system, school of teachers and administrators, their job is to educate our children, to teach them to learn, right? Everybody agrees with that. But sometimes before you can even start educating a child and teaching them to learn, you can't get around the elephant in the room. You have to address and be sensitive to the external problems that that child and that family may be experiencing. So I'm here to advocate for trauma-informed care. Trauma-informed care is just a way of saying that we need to more, be more sensitive, sensitize ourselves to the impact that trauma has on children and families, in particular women. Now, I've overcome a huge hurdle, huge hurdle. School administrators, they didn't get it. They, didn't, they wanted to be in denial, like, well, what does trauma have to do with children's learning and ability to learn. I contacted the American Federation of Teachers, big organization out there who gives um, CEUs to teachers in order to, for them to be recertified. So they said, you know, our curriculum says that teachers only have to be recertified in math, English, and sciences. That's what they give their CEUs to. Nowhere on this list is there anything to do or to deal with or recognize or acknowledge that trauma has an impact on student learning. So I had to make a case for my position and said, you know, school administrators, teachers, principals have to recognize the importance of, of, of trauma in the lives of our students in order to help them to learn. We have to close that achievement gap. In order to close that achievement gap, we have to get children to learn. So, I was very successful. As of yesterday, I received my letter in the mail from the American Federation of Teachers saying, yes, we authorize Connecticut's Women Consortium to provide CEUs to teachers and administrators wow. in, in the public school system. I'm, I'm excited. I'm wow. really happy about this because that means they get it. They got it, and that's a huge organization to impact to see that they got it. Many of our congressmen, our legislators, they got it now. They're getting it. They're recognizing the impact of, of, of these adversities that affect our children, and we're asking them to learn. Now, just like there's an achievement gap, there still is a huge gap between what we know and what we're actually doing about it. We've got to close the gap 
everybody. We've got to get parents, we've got to get school administrators, we've got to get our legislators to work together to create policy, policy that will impact the ability for our school systems to be able to address these issues. All agencies must be on board. This is, we got to get out of our silos. We can't say this is a, a, a problem of, of homeless. We can't say this is a problem of DCF. We can't say that this is a problem of school systems. We, we can't say this is a problem of mental health agencies. This, we can't be in silos anymore. We have to work together collaboratively. That's why I've joined and collaborated with Wynn and partnered with her and I get, I get what she's saying. We have to work together. We have to get parents on board, school administrators, legislators, all to work together and develop some creative, innovative ways to address this problem. Because everybody knows we have a money issue. We, funding is always a, the last of that. You know, we have to create awareness. We have to create policy. And then funding is always on the list. How are we going to fund this? Well, I can tell you one thing. We can either fund it at the onset, at the beginning of the problem, or we can fund it on the tail end by sending out children who don't graduate from school, who don't get a good education, who can't read, get involved in crime and other activities, drug addiction, mental addictions. We fund it. We're funding it now that way. Then they go to prison. We have to worry about incarceration and the cost of prisons. We're funding it, but on the tail end, Let's fund it on the beginning end, at the head end, so we can make a greater impact on awareness and how this affects and stop it dead on at the beginning so we don't have to spend money, millions of dollars, on the, on the back side of it. That's all I'm asking, is just deal with it up front. So, but I wanted to give you some numbers. I had just briefly, I've got to give you these numbers because this is a huge impact. So I had to write it down. Three to ten million children witness domestic violence every year. Three to ten million children. More than one third of adolescents between the ages of 14 and 17 have seen a parent assaulted. Children's television programs average 20 to 25 violent acts of of acts of violence per hour. 20 to 25 acts of violence per hour are witnessed by children watching TV. They get accustomed to that. They see it all the time. This is really important. The typical child will see 8,000 murders by the time they complete elementary school. 8,000 murders before they even finish elementary school. And 40,000 acts of violence by the time they turn 18. You say, not my child. Really? Do your child watch TV? Is there ch children's programming? Does your child play those cute little video games? You know, the man kill him here. You know, they die and they fall down. Acts of violence. When we walk outside, many times, acts of violence. All the time. We have to become more aware of what we're allowing our children to watch experience in their lives. So on that note, I just want to close by saying we have to create a trauma, oh, and, and, and also trauma has been declared a public health crisis. Crisis is declared a public health crisis. Crisis means we need to do something about it. We need immediate and decisive action. So I'm asking everybody, let's act now. Let's think about this. Let's work together. Let's solve this problem. Because the stake of this economy, the stake of our nation is, is, is at peril right now. We have to, it's depending on it. Our existence is depending on us addressing this problem and the lives and the well-being of our children. So thank you very much. Thank you, Bruce. Okay, do I have the time to educate a facility? As soon as it says parent, I was there. So I sent my, my resume in. I had a few emails. 
I had the chance to work with them in Orlando, Florida at the NIAC conference. And I want you to know Gazelle Institute is an untapped resource. And I say that because when I started to understand really ages and stages in early childhood development, that's when I knew there had to be a balance. It can't be all about the ABCs and one, two, threes without the natural progression of age for children. And sometimes we're pushing children into things that they, they just are not developmentally ready for. Doesn't mean that they're slow or they deserve a label, it's just not time. So what a child might not get in the kindergarten, they excel in the first grade. So we have to make sure there's a balance around early child development, how children grow and learn, and then uh, connecting it with the phonics, the cognitive, and all those other things. So at this time, we didn't have, so if you can give an overview, a presentation, so thank you. And she's my boss, so y'all say good things. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Well, I'm very happy to be here this morning and to tell you just a, a few things about Gazelle Institute. First, let me ask, how many people have know about Gazelle Institute? You, you've heard of it before. Okay, just a couple, just a couple. Good. <laughs> anyway, Gazelle Institute has been um, here in New Haven since 1950. So we celebrated our 60th anniversary last year. But Dr. Arnold Gazelle um, actually came to Yale University in 1911 and started the Yale Child Study Center. And that institution is celebrating its 100th birthday this year. So the work of Dr. Arnold Gazelle is just very important um, to the field of education and psychology and the medical field because um, Arnold Gazelle was the first person that really um, studied children and realized that they go through um, um, a, a, a pattern of development and all children go on the same path of development and Gwen alluded to it some children go faster and some go slower and some have a burst they go fast 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 then slow 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 or some children go slow 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 fast 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 and that is just normal development and so my two favorite stories to help you really understand um, development and how each child has their own um, pace of development is um, let's think about when children learn to walk. Okay, think about your own children or maybe you know about your, your own um, development, you ask your mother. But the average age that children learn to walk is 12 months. But 50% learn before 12 months and 50% learn after 12 months. And the normal range is anywhere from eight and three quarters to about 15 or 16 months. So all of that is normal. And what we know is that early walkers are not better walkers than, than um, children that learn a little bit later. And so my second story, or second research fact, is about reading. The average age that children learn to read is 6.5. So that means 50% of children learn before 6.5 and 50% learn after 6.5. But the most compelling part about the research, again, is that early readers are not better readers than those children that learn a little bit later. And I always love to tell the story about my own family. I was an early walker. My mother told me that I walked at nine months. And I also was an early reader. I learned to read before I went to kindergarten. So my own daughter, who's age 28 now, I just assumed she'd be like me, um, but she didn't walk until 14 months, and she really did not learn to read until the end of first grade. Um, but she went on and graduated um, as a merit scholar and, and cum laude from um, New York University, NYU. So again, when you learn to read has nothing to do with intelligence. And what we do at Gazelle Institute is respect development. We support um, the principles of child development and all decision making about young children. And we respect that some children are gonna do it sooner and others are gonna do it later, but sooner is not better and later is not bad. Um, so again, we wanna respect child development and understand um, how children learn. So if you have any other um, um, questions or needs, you can, um, we've been in the same building for, for 60 years, 310 Prospect Street. So. Um, if I can be of service, please let me know. So thank, thank you, Gwen. Sierra. 
and she came on staff as our Spanish staff for Gazelle. But I wanted her, she, she tells us, she's from the Head Start community. And when she was explaining about how we teach Spanish speaking children, English language learners, I just think Connecticut has to do a better job. So if you could just give us a brief, a mini overview of who you are, what you do, and then uh, she will be traveling with me as we, because she's going to be our Spanish uh, speaking staff uh, throughout person, parents, she's also a parent, uh, as we travel through the state. And then we're going to run home, do a, run to the job, we do a meeting and run back on the bus. And so, you know, so we're juggling work and um, work and this experience. So I hope you're enjoying it. Uh, again, this is our launch. I'm just going to get more pep in the step. We're just going to get it all out the way so that you turn your eyes in. But you must pay it forward. The information that you receive today, we have Pastor Eccles from West from New Haven. Yes. So, and then we have a, another pastor that's here. And so they have congregation so that they will be sharing the word. And they'll also be working with us to assure that the words that are on this bus that we uh, preach in our classrooms or in the faith-based institutions about the importance of education go out there it's not meant for us to get the information and keep it it is to share it so again at this time Maria if you can give us a few words and then from there I have a special treat from Why Science and I can't wait to tell you about this uh, partnership with Dr. Um, Akapalu from Why Science so Maria and then we'll have awesome Dr. thing I'm saying Gwen is a shaker and a mover <laughs> She is absolutely incredible and with her strengths and uh, we're just um, so happy to be here and listening to these words and get pumped up because that's what we have to do and that's what she's bringing this spirit of let's do it. Well, as far as the Hispanic community and the Latino community, I think we do have a lot of work to keep on keeping on. There's certain things as Glenn was telling us, we're a country who says English only. There are a lot of people who say these are learning up to three to the four different languages. We're lagging behind as Bren talked about it. Our the academic gap that we have is just absolutely amazing. But research clearly shows that when a child is taught in its first language, they excel in a matter of time. Uh, with English as a language, English as a second language, children. When I am able to rhyme in their own language, when I am able, as she when was talking about phonological awareness, when I'm able to rhyme in their own language, when I'm able to speak in their own language, they begin to grasp the sounds that are transferable over to English language. When a child comes in to the classroom with no, absolutely no understanding of what is going on, it misses a huge part of his development, a part where he is, does have the right to read a book, has the right to understand, has the right to begin to try to um, create this uh, critical thinking. Why do you think? What do you think? Where do you think? Bringing up these open questions, but they are not able to because they simply do not understand. English is second language. I really hope that we really embrace this, have this understanding that it's not about something about English only. It's about preparing our children. It's about breaking these children and giving them skills that they need to become the people that we need. As Gwen said, coming right back, that these children are our future. Our future to begin to make these um, critical moves and decisions in the near future. And now we're not talking simply about Connecticut, we're talking about internationally. There is one model down in El Paso, Texas, who have the children in bilingual, it's a dual program. They have children bilingual in um, up to kindergarten in Spanish and English. From, from first grade to sixth grade, they add another language on. By the time in secondary language, they're adding another language on. These children are the most sought out children in the state, in the United States. Because they have four languages and they're moving and they understand, and just the brain development as an early learner, when you begin to give these two languages, the brain development is just absolutely going wild. So I just want to throw this little seed out there today saying, we really have to think the English only thing. <laughs> and thank I thank you so, you so much, much. Gwen. Gwen, I was here to translate. So. Uh, thank you. <laughs>
Now, Dr. Acapo, if you can just... I work with United Way, and I'm the director of the Boost program, which is a component of the New Haven School Change Initiative. Has anybody heard of it? Yes. Any of your kids go to Boost schools? Yes. Where? Metropolitan. Great. So Metro is a great example. That's our one high school right now. Currently, we're focused in five schools in New Haven. We're at Metro as our first pilot high school, Barnard Environmental Studies Magnet School, Clinton Avenue School, Troop, and Wexler Grant. So you may have children or you may live in those communities. And as I mentioned, Boost is one of the components of the overall New Haven School Change Initiative, and we focus on the community and families aspect. So you probably have heard of, for instance, um, the Promise Program, the Promise Scholarship Program. That's another component of New Haven School Change. We all overall focus on the three main citywide goals, which are cutting the dropout rate in half, um, closing the achievement gap, and preparing the best that we possibly can, all seniors to graduate and be ready financially and academically to succeed in college and beyond. So that's what we're all about. Um, I can give you a little bit more information specifically on Boost. What we're doing is we are, <coughs> Boost is a systems change movement. So we're here to stay and Boost will grow. We will add an additional five to 10 schools every year until we're across the whole city and all of our schools, including the magnets. Um, we are there to offer support um, in terms of manpower and also technological support to track all of the external partners and community organizations that are involved in your kids' schools. So we're here to connect. We know that New Haven is extremely resource rich. We have tons of nonprofit organizations. We have tons of youth serving organizations that are doing really amazing things. However, we're kind of focused in different places and we want to kind of break that sense of people working in their own silos. And we want everybody in the community to be committed to the success of our children. So what we've asked is for the community organizations to get more involved in what's going on in the schools. And that doesn't mean that they have to um, take their after school program out of the neighborhood and stick it into a school somewhere. That just means that we're asking for communication to happen across all of those boundaries. So if your child goes to Wexler Grant School and then they come home and they go to a, um, you know, an after school program, a common ground school or some other place, what we've developed is a system so that people can communicate about what those kids are doing. So no child should be, you know, if they need academic support in reading or language or something, they sh we, d we don't feel that they should be plucked out of their boys and girls club after school program. If that's where they feel safe and that's where they're healthy and that's where they're happy and that's where they're with their friends after school and they're doing a really good job, we don't want to tell them that you can no longer go because we need you to stay after school to do this other thing. What we want is for the teacher and boys and girls club to communicate and to say, hey, can you help out so and so with their reading and language issues? Like, let's all talk about what's going on and let's get on the same page. So that's generally what Boost is about. We've asked community organizations to offer their services. We, right now, like I mentioned, we're focusing on those five schools. We will be identifying another five in January. So you should hear a big announcement about that. And um, if you have any questions, if your children or any of those schools are in those neighborhoods, please definitely feel free to call me if you have you know, any questions about that. I, like I said, work for the United Way, but Boost is a partnership between United Way, the city, and the New Haven Public Schools. So we're always working together. We're formulating plans. We're doing the best they can. I spend most of my time coming out and visiting with the community organizations and also in the schools. We have a support staff that has been hired by United Way um, AmeriCorps volunteers and other volunteers that have committed to at least one to three years of service. So they will be in those schools full time to help out with all this boost work. So it will not be an additional strain on the administration in the school or your kids teachers or anything like that. We are here to form that system of communication so that everybody can truly be working in partnership all for the success of the kids. We focus on four domains. Um, physical health and wellness, social, social emotional, behavioral health, um, family engagement, parent engagement, and also student support services. So that's really any external partners or community programs that are coming in to do either before school or after school programs. So in the end, what we're asking schools to commit to when they sign on to be a Boost school, they're committing to taking those four domains and bringing them up to the level of importance as academic achievement because we feel really strongly that if a 
kid walks into school that day and they have some external factors that may be playing a role in them just having a tough time really concentrating and sitting there and taking on the style of learning and teaching that maybe their classroom is, you know, kind of putting upon them. We feel that if we concentrate on those other um, domains as well, that it's only going to do, we, we want to wrap our arms around, these are called wraparound services. So we're literally wrapping our arms around the whole child and we want to make sure that they're feeling successful and healthy and happy in all of those aspects. And we feel really strongly that in the end, this is going to help get us to the, our citywide achievement goals for our kids. So that's a very overview type thing. I'm here to answer any questions if you have any. I can tell you that I do have no idea who those five schools are going to be in January. I wish I did, but I don't know yet. And um, we'll work with those schools to get them ready to implement Boost in their um, in their schools starting next September. And then we'll kind of do the same thing every year. We'll add five to ten additional schools until we're all over the city. So we're here to add manpower and technical support to anybody who needs it in those schools. And we're really excited about what we're doing. Thank you so much, yeah. Beth, for coming. She came at the last minute. I know. I'm sorry meeting. that I ran No, 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 here, no. You were great. I appreciate you bringing it. And uh, know that we'll be speaking. The Connecticut Parents Union will be working with you so that Good. we're connecting the communities uh, to the service because it supports the whole child. Mm -hmm. So, again, thank you so much for coming out. There is, so we know, hot cocoa. I kept my word about...